Hi, this is Seth Mosley, and you're listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. And I'm here with our co-host, X O'Connor. How's it going? X is a bit of a new voice to the Full Circle Music Show, but you'll be hearing a lot more of it in these upcoming weeks. And today we have the opportunity to sit down with John Steingard of the band Hawk Nelson. John is an awesome dude and shared with us a little bit about touring, about the many live shows, and even how he's doing a a lot in the uh, video production side of things as well, too. So I I think I personally like this interview because he talks a lot about if you're a new artist moving to Nashville, what are some of the things that you need to know before you jump into two head first? Yeah, he also covers a lot about how the road affects the money that you're making as an artist and how it's an essential part of being an artist if you want to be successful and make a living that way. But he also talks about finding other ways to be creative that also feed your musical creativity. And he kind of, I, I thought it was cool, he, he he used a term that he calls re-entry, that when you're touring and you come back home, it's like if you're married to somebody, if you're in a relationship, you have to figure out how to navigate that, so... Lots of interesting stuff in this, but before we jump into the interview, just a quick announcement about the Music Makers Boot Camp. Are you an aspiring artist, producer, or songwriter? Have you ever wanted to break into the music business but didn't know where to start? Would you be interested in spending a weekend with some of the leaders in the industry? Well, here is your opportunity. It's called the Music Makers Boot Camp, and it's happening January 25th through 28th live in Franklin, Tennessee. It's going to be happening at the legendary Sound Kitchen Studios, where records like Taylor Swift, Paramore, Keith Urban, Bruce Springsteen, and many more have been made. You'll be learning in these rooms where multi-platinum songs have come to life, and we'll be bringing in some of the best and the brightest who are doing it every day to share their wisdom, knowledge, and experience. This is a great opportunity for you to take your music production, songwriting, or artistry skills to the next level. The music industry doesn't have to be some big secret. Me and the other coaches really want to share what we are doing with you. Come and learn it with us. Registration is now open at fullcirclegoeslive.com. Or you can text the word BOOTCAMP. That's B-O-O-T-C-A-M-P, one word to 44222 to receive info about it. Again, that's fullcirclegoeslive.com or you can text bootcamp to 44222 to receive info on it. It's limited to only 40 spots, so get yours now. These sell out quick, so don't miss your chance. I'll see you there. And now let's jump into the interview. So we're here in the studio with John Steingard on the Full Circle Music Show. What's up, guys? How you doing, my friend? I'm doing really good. I'm pumped to see some familiar faces here. I think we have a new face on the show other than myself. Yes, we have two new faces today, being my co-host, Michael X. O'Connor, who just goes by X. How's it going, everybody? I didn't know your real name for the first year that I knew you. (laughs) I try to keep it that way. You know, the the mystere is definitely needed, you know? (laughs) The artist formerly known as. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you yeah. gotta, it adds a little personality. The some artist flair. formerly known as the artist formerly known yeah. as X. <laughs> yeah. I like to have as many things before it is humanly possible. Well, <laughs> you actually have a tattoo on your arm. I don't think many people listening to this show know that. But. I do. I've got the X right there on my arm. So it's committed. You know, I am, you know. I'm in yeah, it for the Ed, long haul. Ed Sheeran's album cover on your arm. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, man, you I really love Ed that. Sheeran. I mean, <laughs> dude, yeah, you know, I'm a fan, you know, what can I say? You have to pay, like, a licensing fee to Ed Sheeran? Yeah, you know, there was there was talks, you know, we worked something Every out. time you wear a short sleeve shirt? Yeah, ex- naturally. I, I think I came first, though. I don't know. So, you know. I think you did. It's, it's debatable, you know, that's for the suits in Washington to decide, you know, it's more than I got. So we have John Steingart in the house. We've gotten to work together on a record and done a bunch of writing and other work. And John's just an awesome person. So shucks, the listeners are in for a treat. So why don't you just kind of pull back the curtain and share your backstory? Yeah, how'd you, how'd so, you get into music? And Yeah, it's convoluted a little bit as it is for most people, I think. But I'm in a band called Hawk Nelson. We're from Canada originally and been in the U.S. for about 13 years or something like that. And... I'm a pastor's kid, so I grew up in church and playing on worship teams and that kind of stuff. And at one point, I had a youth pastor that was like, you're pretty good at the guitar. You should be in a band. And I was like, I was like super nerdy. And so I was like, I can't be in a band. Like, band guys are cool. Like, 
I have these big thick Coke bottle glasses. And you were like, not, you were like geocaching. And they're like, like and yeah, <laughs> geocaching. <laughs> but actually, my youth I, I, I did me geocaching, up. so I guess <laughs> that makes me. A, I did, I did. When I used to tour, that's that's, a, that's another story. But <laughs> sorry. that's amazing. Derailed that is, I mean, it's, a, it's yeah. <laughs> uh, so my youth pastor hooked me up with my first band. We were called Noise Gate, and the only reason we were called Noise Gate is because we thought of the name Pitch Shifter. And apparently there was already a band called that. And we just looked down at a pedal board and looked at another pedal and just picked that name. Solid. Pretty good. So this is in Southern Ontario. And basically there was just this huge, in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was this big music scene there. And so I was in a band, a bunch of my friends were in bands, and eventually most everyone got real jobs. And there's like a few people left like holding this hot potato of music. And it was me and a few other people. And we all kind of found each other and then ended up in this band, Hawk Nelson. I was the guitar player for a long, long time. And then uh, about four, almost five years ago, our singer left and I became the singer in a kind of a wild turn of events and kind of found myself here today. Yeah, Dude, that's awesome, man. Yeah. What was your first live show? First live show was July 2004. Oh, sorry, no. First live show with Hawk was July. Well, I, I guess that could be a two part question. Uh, first, first live show you ever saw. Oh gosh. Okay. Well, first live show with Noise Gate was in a skate park, which at the time seemed like amazing. Like we're playing at a skate park. <laughs> uh, that's so cool. I didn't really skate at the time. I think that was gosh. I was fifteen. And the guys I was in a band with were all like quite a bit older than me. They were like 21, 22. And it was this like prog rock thing. Oh, nice. Like we were, like really wanted to play a song in 7, 8, you know. <laughs> uh, so that was my first experience with a live show at the skate park. And I was, I was hooked. I was like, this is so fun. And then, yeah, with Hawk, my first experience. The skateboarding ties in in both, actually. I realize this now. My first show with Hawk was July 2004 in Omaha, Nebraska at this place called The Rock. And the I've been week- there. You've been there? Oh, I've yeah. There. It's not there anymore. I went there probably 2007, maybe. Yeah. I think it was still there at the time. Yep. I think it was there for a little while longer. Yeah. But it was like where like Tooth and Nail bands would play and Hawk was on Tooth and Nail. And so I had started in between my first show and my first show with Hawk. I had started skateboarding and I had a, just a massive, massive accident about a week before I started playing with Hawk. So my first show, I played with bandages on my hands. Because <laughs> when I fell, I put my hands out. Yeah. And my hands were just all chewed up. And so That's tough being a guitar player. So punk rock. <laughs> I think everyone was like, this guy's got what it takes to be in a punk band. <laughs> <laughs> no pain, no gain. Oh, right? absolutely, man. So up to now, how many shows have you played out? Like- See, I tried to figure this out the other day. The first few years we played, we were doing about 250 a year, which is a lot. But that was like... <laughs> that is a lot. <laughs> yeah. There's like there's only 100 more days than that, really. Yeah. And it doesn't mean we were home those 100 days. It was usually like... At a, traveling. Or you whatever. know, at a Waffle House or yeah. something. But I think if I really had to add it up, it would be a couple thousand, I would think. I mean, somewhere just shy of 2,000 would have to be my guess. Wow. No, maybe more than two. I don't know. Somewhere in and around 2000. It's a lot. It gets blurry. Man, that's a few shows. That it's is a, a few shows. It's a shows. couple shows. It's like almost, yeah. it's like six years worth of shows. Oh, I If, if you did that. like day after day, that would yeah. be like six years. That's so crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's been 13. It's been like 13 or something like that. So, man, that, yeah, that's that, awesome, man. That's super. About half the time. Sounds about right. <laughs> Have you been married that whole time? Not entirely, but pretty close. I met my wife. Right around, I think the same year I joined the band in an unrelated thing. We met before I was in the band. And then I started getting to see her more often once I was in the band and we were traveling. She's from California. So I would find myself out there. And the first record that we put out had a song called California. And so we ended up playing in California a lot. And so I found myself out there. And then we we got married like two years later. And so we're coming up on our 10-year anniversary pretty soon. So she's kind of been with you the entire she, time. It's all we've ever known. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, and honestly, we're still trying to figure, we have seasons where we're like, we got this. We know how to do this. And other seasons where we're like, we're kind of like, 
it beats us a little bit. We're yeah. just trying to stay connected and we're both really independent. So actually when I'm gone, that's not the problem. Yeah. It's like when I get home trying to like figure out, wait, how do we like do this together? Like yeah. we're so used to our own routines. Yeah. So we have this period we call re-entry. <laughs> yeah. But it's just like, it's like coming back into the atmosphere, you know? Is it like that kind of same experience where it's really, really bumpy and like a sometimes. spaceship coming back down? Well, sometimes <laughs> it's like the weirdest thing. Like you'll come home or I'll come home and we'll have this 24 hour period where we don't really know how to relate to each other. Yeah. And we don't really know how, what, like, what am I supposed to do here? I, like it feels awkward. Yeah. And then you feel bad for it feeling awkward because you're like, I've been married to this person for almost 10 years. Like, this should not be awkward. And then you start thinking, oh, something's wrong. Like, like, oh my gosh, we're in trouble. Like, this isn't how it's supposed to be. And those thoughts just sort of pile up. And, you know, eventually, you, either we get into a fight and then working through that fight gets us back into it. So yeah. sometimes I'll like, I'll be tempted to instigate. <laughs> You're like, let's just, <laughs> let's fight. Cause then, <laughs> just uh, get it out of the way. <laughs> or then, or other times I'll get home and it'll just be like seamless. It's the weirdest yeah. thing. I can't put my finger on it. But, I guess I don't think this is exclusive to touring musicians. I think it's just marriage. Like, yeah. like you just have periods that are harder than others and periods that are easier. And I don't know. Mm. So a lot of artists nowadays, in order to make it work, I mean, they're having to tour yeah. insane amounts, 200 shows a year, sometimes more. And they do it out of necessity just because right. that's where artists make their money. It's not as much off of royalties. Or yeah whatever maybe like it used to be you guys still tour a good bit right we do we we probably do a hundred or so a year which is less than we used to do it's less than some people do but it's for people with families that's still substantial yeah and yeah it's interesting i know there has been a transition over the last 10 years or so from artists feeling like they want to tour to make money or because they like it versus the necessity uh, making less money on records and stuff like that. We have always been touring focused, like from the get go, like to a pretty hilarious degree. Like, <laughs> I mean, we were just the way that our first record deal was structured. It was just a traditional type of deal. It was with Tooth and Nail in Seattle. And we would make a record and then we would go and tour that record. And in our minds, for some reason, we kind of thought like, oh, you know, everything to do with the record other than the music itself is, like, not our job. And so we would just make a record or, you know, record an album, and yeah. then we'd go play shows for a couple of years and play those songs. And that was, like, our focus completely. To the point where, like, we would find out that, like, we didn't know which of our songs were the radio singles. <laughs> we didn't. <laughs> People would come to the show and be like, I heard such and such a song on the radio. And we'd be like, oh, cool. And then, like, I remember one time... Like someone brought us like a plaque for like a number one radio single. It was CHR. Back at that time, CHR had a pretty big audience still. Yeah. And I remember like we didn't even know that that song was on the radio. Like we just like we yeah. were so disconnected from it. We were <laughs> completely focused on touring. And now like I think our perspective is much more comprehensive. Like we look at everything and go like how can this thing as a whole grow? Yeah. We're still really touring as far as income goes. We're still really touring focused. And I think we've tried to grow the other side of things. Like the way that our label relationship is structured now is much more of a partnership. We yeah. pay for our own albums and we'll participate in revenue from that in a different way than we would have in a kind of an old school record deal. But touring is still the main thing. So do you feel like you do that out of still loving it or is it a little more of a necessity nowadays it's like marriage man it's seasons yeah it's like i have seasons where i absolutely love it and seasons where i go i don't know how long i can do this you know like usually every august every august is when i'm like ready to call it because it's like <laughs> the end of the summer even playing outdoor shows they're either hot or you get rained out yeah you know it's just like summer can be a beat down yeah. When we first started, I loved playing summer festivals. Oh my gosh, it's so fun. There's all yeah. these people. There's all these other bands. You get to see each other. You know, like, oh, it's like family, you know, yeah. summer camp. And then and then eventually you're like, oh gosh, this is really hot. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're getting rained out again. And the travel is much harder because festivals are every which place. Yeah. And 
it's not like routed, you know, in a way that makes sense for travel. And then a lot of times in the fall, we'll be on a tour and things will just lock in and I'll be like, oh, I do love this. Yeah. So I don't know. It's seasons for me. It is still a necessity financially for everybody in the band. And honestly, over the last three or four years, I think from an income point of view, like all of us have developed other avenues of of making money that we can do at the same time just because you know if we're only playing 100 shows a year we actually do have some time to do other things and i actually feel like a little bit of balance there it can be healthy yeah. and they that can be things that complement what we do as well like micah our guitar player who you know yeah because we met through you yeah micah you know writes and produces and he's very talented with that stuff and I do some of that. I've been doing a lot of video production recently, and yeah. Dan has a garden he tends to. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> That's producing. Some, sometimes yeah. when he goes home, I don't entirely know what he does, <laughs> <laughs> but he Instagrams flowers. <laughs> so you know he's alive. You yeah. Know, he's and, out there doing something. Well, and he also, like for the band, he handles all the merchandise and stuff like that, and that's a massive job. That's one of the things I'm like really grateful to not be a solo artist and to be in a band where you know everyone is everyone's ha- pitching in. Everyone's kind of doing things that are their, you know, cup of tea or their skill set or whatever and sure. There's so many things that Dan does that I'm really grateful that that you're not I doing. I don't have to do. <laughs> I'm just not good at it either. Like okay, maybe you guys have seen this. Band merch. If there's a t-shirt that you personally like, no one wants to buy it. <laughs> and then and then you'll see a shirt that I'm like, I, I don't know that I would wear that. And then it'll go like gangbusters. Yeah. yeah. So I'm maybe that's just me. I'm just really bad at calling what works for merch. Anyway. And he's really good at it. He's much better than me. Yeah. He it's not that he never misses, but he misses a lot less than I would. Yeah. So he designs it in everything. His wife actually does. Oh, that's great. Yeah, his wife's a graphic artist, really talented. And she, yeah, she's done a lot of our graphic art, you know, the last 10 years. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. Keeping it in the fam. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier that touring was a big part of it. And before you guys, you know, you weren't even really aware of what was going on at radio. So unaware. So has that changed now? Yes. So how has that changed and started to affect you guys? Well, I mean, it really started, there was a really clear line in the sand when Jason, our old singer, when he left the band, we were also at the end of our record deal. So it was a really natural point to sort of reset some things. And that's when I moved into the role of lead singer. And the first year of that was trying to figure out what that even looked like. I mean, mm-hmm. Seth, you were involved in that process and were mm-hmm. very helpful in speaking into it. And But we sort of reformulated everything. My voice is so different than Jason's voice that like I'm just not like a punk rock singer. Yeah. And I just love pop music. And so I think we went musically in that direction a little bit more. We developed a new label partnership with Fairtrade, who we think really highly of, and just sort of refocused what our goals are. And we wanted, especially as we were getting older as well, like we're not like 18 anymore. Yeah. We just wanted to write music that was maybe applicable to a wider audience than we had before. And I think our musical preferences catered well to that. Mm-hmm. So we definitely focused more on songs that would work across larger demographics and that meant ac radio Mm -hmm. and our first single was called words and i wrote it with seth and our buddy matt hammett and seth produced it and it was the first time we had a song on ac radio that really connected and man seeing the impact of that at shows seeing what that meant just across the board was a kind of a game changer for us it changed the experience while you're out playing (laughs) yeah Yeah. because i'm like And it was a different audience than we had had before as well. I started asking, you know, how many people at shows, how many people have seen us before? And we'd have like maybe 5% of the crowd put their hand up. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. We really started over to a large degree. And instead of being bummed about that, we were like kind of excited to feel like we had a bit of a clean slate. So for a lot of people, especially the more AC audience, like we were a, a new artist. And so the last three or four years have been, you know, sort of growing things from that point of view to a large degree. Yeah. Yeah. So was that a transition from side man to front man? We've talked, actually yeah. just talked to Barry Grohl about this last week because he's guitar player, side man in Mercy Me. Yeah. And we talked about the differences between being a side man and a front man. Yep. 
I say a lot that like the world looks really different 10 feet over. Yeah. Like it does. I mean, you are sort of the conduit that's connecting the audience with the band. And I believe really strongly for us that we are a band. And so like, it's not like a solo artist situation. And I really try to always pay attention to moments where it feels like it's going that way. Like for instance, like this tour we were on, the first show we played, I felt like the other guys were in the dark lighting wise a lot. And so I talked to the lighting guy and I'm like, look, we're a band. Everybody has to be lit up. This can't be just like lead singer in the spotlight. But having said that, it is a completely different thing than being, you know, guitar player over to one side or drummer behind. In between songs, you know, you can't, you don't really get a break in a show. Uh, I mean, everyone's watching you. Yeah. And in Christian music, particularly, I think there's this expectation, and not wrongly so, that you're going to have something worthwhile to say. Mm-hmm. And I think because Christian music is such a lyrically driven format that like having messages of hope and messages that really resonate with people is like, that's the thing. And I mean, we didn't think about it that way until until really this season with me as the singer. Like when we were just a punk band before, we were just like, oh... Yeah. This beat is cool. <laughs> um, literally, on one record, we were like, our goal was how fast can we play? Yeah, like we did a song at two twenty six BPM because oh, we wow. were like, we like <laughs> to to prove a point. I don't know, it's so stupid. But yeah, as a frontman of a Christian band, I realized that there is something pastoral about what we're doing, and I never intended to be a pastor. In fact, when I was a kid. Like, I remember saying to God, like, hey, God, I'll do anything you want me to do. I just, please, I don't ever want to be a pastor. <laughs> and, I, and I feel like he sort of snuck me in this back door, and he's very sneaky. <laughs> but I found myself in this place where I realized, man, if God can use me to communicate things that matter to him about the people that he loves, mm-hmm. then it's incumbent upon me to, like, open myself up to that. And I don't think, I was having this conversation with another artist named Dan Bremnis. Do you know Dan Bremnis? Mm -hmm. I do. Good Canadian boy. (laughs) And just talking about this idea of what it means to be in a Christian band and have people look to you for truth or meaning or whatever. And it can be really tempting to just start putting bows on things where we feel like we're supposed to deliver this answer to people. And sometimes it's tempting to gloss over the fact that we don't always know what that answer is. And, you know, you're on stage, there's this pressure to, like, have these answers. And on a very basic level, like, I mm-hmm. I believe, like, having Jesus in your life and letting him fill you up is the answer to a lot of things. But to say it like that sometimes in certain situations, like, doesn't it doesn't respect the struggle and it doesn't mm-hmm. respect the, like, not knowing that a lot of people have it including us that are making this music, you know? Mm-hmm. And I'm still trying to figure out that tension. Like, I said this to Dan the other day. I was like, when I meet a Christian artist who doesn't seem like they're struggling with that tension, that makes me concerned, you know? And all the people I respect the most wrestle with it. Yeah. Like, guys like Toby, Toby Mac, I know he wrestles with it. You know, I, Stephen Curtis Chapman, that dude wrestles. You know, Bart Millard, that dude wrestles a lot. Yeah. And I don't know, I respect people who are willing to be vulnerable with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you can kind of think back to young John Steingard pre pro music (laughs) days, (laughs) I'm sure there's, you know, knowing what you know now, is there anything that you would say to John before he got into the music business? I would say to be fearless. So many situations looking back when I was afraid of things, I realized later that like there wasn't nearly as much to be afraid of as I realized or as I thought there was. And also in the times where it feels like you don't know what's going on, it feels like nothing's working, like there's always something on the horizon that, I mean, for me, because I'm a believer, like I believe God is preparing those things. If you're not a believer, you might feel like that's just life coming your way. I don't know. But for me, I look at my life and I go, God has provided for me every step of the way. 
Mm -hmm. And it hasn't always been in obvious ways. It hasn't always been in the ways that I would have hoped that he would have at the time. But it's always been good. And it's always been, I mean, often it's been better than I would have orchestrated for myself if I could have. Yeah. And I I say sometimes that like all the best things in my life were not my idea. And that's Mm. true. I would just say to be bold and fearless and love the people around you well and work hard. Yeah. And try to hold on to joy as much as you possibly can and don't let anybody or anything steal it from you. Mm. Yeah, that's a big thing because I think we're in an industry where you're only as good as your next Completely. number one or next whatever it is, you know? Yeah. So so how do you be joyful yeah. when you don't have that number one? Exactly. Or how do you be joyful when you have the number one and you're not just yeah. thinking about what the next one is? Dude, you know? So we we had a song called Drops in the Ocean that was actually, for me as a writer, my first AC number one. Yeah. And when I found that out, I had an absolutely miserable week because I had these two thoughts running through my mind. The first thought was, no one's going to think it was because of me. I wrote it with a very talented writer named Jason Ingram, who you know. And another talented dude named Matt Bronlewey. And so I just like, I had it in the back of my head. Everyone is going to think that this song is great because of these guys and not because of me. Mm. So that was one thought. And then the other thought was like, well, now I have to do it again. Yeah. And otherwise I'm headed in the wrong direction. Otherwise it was just a splash in the pan. And it, I guess at the core, I was afraid that that success wasn't going to stick to me, you know? Yeah. I was afraid that it was just going to be a fleeting moment. And I had about a week where I was like really stressed about that and ashamed that I felt those things too because they're ugly, you know, those are ugly thoughts. And I felt really clearly God sort of just dropped this idea into my head at one point. And it was just this thought of like, hey, any good thing in your life whether it's something that you made with your own hands or whether you had help or whatever, where do you think those things come from? Yeah. And do you really think that this is the last good thing that I'm going to bring into your life? Right. And then I felt God just kind of say like, hey, why don't you just assume that this is a gift from me and has nothing to do with you? Mm. And just enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, just get up tomorrow morning And just see, I wonder what God has in store for me today. And like, he was like, I felt like him kind of saying like, wouldn't you be living a much more joyful life if you looked at it that way? And Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And so I don't know. I feel like I'm holding things a little more loosely now. And I think that's important. It doesn't mean I don't work hard. I know. I mean, like you guys work super hard and I know it's the same for you guys. Like every day you submit to what God has planned for you that day. And you work hard, be kind to people, and try to hold on to the joy of remembering that what we get to do is special. Yeah. And then it's in God's hands. And at the end of the day, when I go to bed, I literally sometimes think about, okay, this day and anything I did today, like, God, this is in your hands. It doesn't belong to me. Mm. That can come off as like a line or a cliche thing. But the more that you can own that, I think the happier you'll be. Yeah. That's great. So... With all this that you've gone through now from, you know, being a kid up till now, all your experience in the music industry, do you think now is a good time for young up-and-comers to get into music? Yes. And why is that? I think you're going to hear a lot of people say no to that question. Mm -hmm. Or go, uh... But here's why I say yes. In my lifetime, I have never seen such an opportunity for people to be creative and then bring that creativity out into the world. I, there, it's just, whether you, you're talking about the internet, you're talking about YouTube, SoundCloud, yeah. Spotify, Apple Music, CD Baby, TuneCore, whatever. Yeah. Big labels, small labels, indie artists. It's the Wild West. Yeah. You know? For sure. I think that for new artists, there's tremendous opportunity to put yourself out there and gain an audience. I just think you can't think about it the same way. Yeah. Like the days of like, writing three songs and walking into a label office and playing them and then getting a record deal and getting a big advance and this huge marketing budget. I mean, I'm not saying that can't happen, but those days for the most part are gone. Yeah. 
And I think if you want to be a musician, you have to realize you're, you're starting a business. Unless you don't want to make money doing mm-hmm. it. If you just want to do it on the side, then that's actually awesome too. Like, yeah. I believe that there can be a difference between your calling and your vocation. Mm-hmm. You know, like, so I think if you want to do music for a career, then you have to basically in today's climate, you have to think of yourself as a media company mm-hmm. and go like, okay, how can I utilize social media how can I utilize things like YouTube or podcasts mm-hmm. or, you know, like all of these things and play to your strengths. I mean, like if you're terrible in front of a camera, then probably don't do a YouTube channel. Yeah. <laughs> but figure out like what are your strengths or follow people that you love what they do and start by, I mean, don't be afraid to quote unquote imitate. I mm-hmm. mean, uh, like I started vlogging recently and yeah. I and like I was terrified to do that because I was like, people are going to think, why is this 33-year-old guy vlogging? Isn't that like a kind of a young people thing? And who does he think he is that people actually want to see like little clips from his life? But I started just sort of like following these vloggers that I love. And I'm like, I love this style. I love this way of communicating. I love, I love this. Yeah. And so if you find things that you love to do that relate to music in some way, I think that you can bring those into the wheelhouse of what you do. And it's not just about music and records and and stuff i think if you think about your career from a broader point of view then i think music can be an awesome thing to get into right now where do we find your vlogs my my am i pronouncing it right yeah yeah so so it was Uh, vlog yeah well no that so this is this is what happened i started doing these vlogs and for those that don't know a vlog is just a video blog that's why it's a v-l-o-g vlog but our manager, Ryan, he had seen me put out a few and he, he had never heard me are say they, vlog. Are they John Steingard Yeah, vlogs, just John, if you search John Steingard on YouTube, J-O-N-S-T-E-I-N-G-A-R-D, or you could just go to youtube.com slash John Steingard. Okay. That's my channel. I vlog like probably two, three times a week. Cool. But our manager, Ryan, he had seen the word written, but he had never heard me say it or someone say it. And so... <laughs> He was like, I think it's great what you're doing with those vlogs. <laughs> I would have been <laughs> and, in that same and boat. I bust. Oh my gosh, I bust so much. And then a couple episodes later, like we were talking about it, and I was like, guys, I'm going to call it the vlog. So I branded it as the vlog. So, like, there's a little icon <laughs> if you watch it on, on a computer or on your phone, like turned sideways. There's yeah. a little, little logo on the bottom that says Vlog. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Man, that so, I, awesome. I just pulled it up. You actually like produce these things. Yeah. Pretty so, good. I, I mean, it's one of the things, you know, in the spirit of widening your lane as a musician, you know, I've been getting into video production a ton. So, some of it is like more professional shoots. Like Some this is all is, like iPhone stuff, right? No, no. Or this, I, this, so this is full on like your I'm vlogs. I'm a little bit hardcore. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I meant to have my camera rolling for this actually and I forgot. Should be vlogging right now. I know. <laughs> Li- live stream. Which one did you pull up? John, you don't need permission to start. Oh yeah. That's one of the early ones. I was still figuring that out. That's pretty awesome, man. I think I'm on episode 24. Okay. Very so, cool. It's not like you guys are on episode like 40 something, 45. I believe by the time that this episode comes out, it'll be, I think, the 45th one. Got to catch up. Yeah. I got to catch up. <laughs> Plus or minus one or two. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for stopping by today. We My appreciate pleasure, you man. Yeah. Thank the time you for chatting. And, it was great. Yeah. yeah. It's been great talking to you, man. Learning a little bit more about you. Love it. Hi, this is Seth Mosley. You've been listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. That was a great interview with John Steingard. Learned a lot about what he's got happening, especially all the cool videos and social media stuff that he's been putting up there for people to kind of keep track of what's going on. Really cool. Check out his, uh, we actually learned about what a vlog is. Before you do anything else, we'd greatly appreciate it if you head over to iTunes, take literally one minute, leave us a good rating and a good review. That helps us out a ton. Appreciate all of you guys who are listening. The numbers are growing every single week. And uh, again, if you haven't checked out the Music Makers Boot Camp, it's selling out very fast. And uh, you can check that out at fullcirclegoeslive.com. And we will see you next week. Have a good week, guys.